Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Back in 2015, a heat wave in India and Pakistan caused the deaths of about 3,500 people. That came after temperatures across much of South Asia soared above 45 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, unfortunately, as climate change progresses, such heat waves are expected to become much more common all around the world over the next few decades, but they're going to be especially problematic in poor and heavily populated areas of South and Southeast Asia. Now, according to a study last year by researchers at MIT and some other institutions, the proportion of India's people that will be regularly exposed to temperatures within three degrees Celsius of what humans can survive is going to rise from about 2% of the population today to 70% by the end of the century. Now, deadly heat waves aside, climate change is going to have big effects uh, elsewhere in the region as well. The summer monsoon rains are changing, affecting farmers. Rising sea levels may flood low-lying settlements. Higher ocean temperatures are going to harm sea life. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at how climate change has begun to affect life in South and Southeast Asia, a region of the world that's particularly vulnerable. Now, in a few minutes, we'll hear from a group of three people who have been following this issue closely from a couple of different perspectives. First, we're going to talk to Rina Chandran, a veteran business correspondent in Asia and the U.S. She's now a correspondent in Bangkok, Thailand with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Rena, welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, talk to us if you would. Why is this part of the world particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change? Well, um, there's, uh, there's long coastlines here. And as you mentioned, uh, these are areas that are heavily populated. We're talking about 60% of the world's population in Asia. And you have two thirds of the world's poor population in the Asia Pacific region. So they're extremely vulnerable to um, changes in the climate. And is it visible? I mean, can you see today how the effects of climate change are affecting people's lives? Yes, you can see the changes uh, across the spectrum from farmers who are struggling to harvest a single crop in a year from three crops, of, you know, 10 years before, uh, to women who are struggling to get water for their families, uh, villagers who are struggling to feed their livestock, urban slum dwellers who are affected by urban flooding. So you can see the changes and the impacts across a broad spectrum. Now, one of the recent articles that you wrote for the Thomson Reuters Foundation was about the Philippines. And in that piece, you linked climate change to increased migration patterns there. Yeah. So this is one of the uh, impacts that's uh, taking place below the radar, if you will. Um, these are women in the Philippines, in the southern Philippines, who, because the land cannot sustain their families anymore, are moving to urban areas and overseas for jobs as domestic workers and as caregivers. Uh, migration is being seen from other parts of the world as well, from Sri Lanka to Nepal to Bangladesh, where it's mostly men who are migrating. The Philippines is quite unique in that there are more women who are migrating than men. Uh, but this is something that governments are now recognizing as a, um, as a uh, response to climate change. Well, you also did some reporting in the southern India state of Tamil Nadu about how climate change was affecting people there. You talked about some farmers there who had also left the countryside. Give us just one or two of their stories. Uh, this is in the uh, Kaveri Delta region, which went through a, a horrific drought situation. Uh, it was a failure of monsoon and uh, the lack of the river water that irrigates their paddy fields typically. Um, so these are farmers who have uh, left their uh, villages and their fields and moved to uh, apparel and textile making factories in the cities, um, leaving behind their wives and children. Uh, many of them even took their lives, which is quite a drastic step to take in response to uh, their crops failing, um, leaving their wives then to pay back the debt that they have taken to uh, try and eke, eke out a living from their lands. And I mean, is there direct evidence that these droughts, these phenomenon are linked to, to climate change? Um, yes. I mean, they were talking about the fact that temperatures are rising, that the monsoon is either inadequate or unpredictable or both. Um, 
when they could do three crops in a year, they're down to one crop. Um, and this is also a paddy growing region and rice is a very water intensive crop. Um, some of them are adapting to the changes with uh, more drought resilient varieties of rice or switching out of rice altogether, but that's not an option for everyone. Well, another one of the articles that you did was about how climate change was affecting economies in Southeast Asia that are dependent on tourism, and you were linking uh, climate change to the closure of a number of beaches. Talk to us about that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination of climate change and just um, unchecked sprawl, if you will, um, that's affecting coral reefs and beaches across um, Thailand, the Philippines. Um, the Philippine president ordered the closure of Boracay, which is one of the most popular beaches in the Philippines, uh, on short notice. So it's, it's, been, it's being shut down. Uh, from later this month for six months. He's given local authorities six months to clean it up. Um, Thailand has shut down a few beaches as well to give the coral reefs time to recover. Um, and authorities are realizing that if you do not check tourist numbers, that with the higher temperatures are going to cause irreversible damage to their coral reefs and beaches, which bring in tourism revenues. Well, you talked about uh, the Philippines, you talked about India. On this issue of beaches, it sounds like the governments have been responding to try to um, sort of mitigate the harms that are taking place here. But what sort of adaptations are the countries in this region taking? Um, the countries are all signatories to the Paris Agreement. So they've all agreed to cut back on their emissions. They're making commitments to renewable energy. Um, they have climate adaptation programs. India has heat mitigation programs, heat action plans. Um, they are putting in early warning systems, for instance, for floods, uh, for urban flooding, for uh, you know high sea waves. Um, farmers are adapting as well. Uh, they're using more drought resilient crops. They're using other irrigation methods. Uh, they're going back to more traditional methods of farming. Um, and like I said, migration is emerging as a major climate change adaptation mechanism because as some researchers have said, there is only so much rebuilding that you can do after each flood and each cyclone. And um, so migration is uh, emerging as a major climate change uh, adaptation mechanism. Well, Rina Chandran, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. This is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about how climate change is already affecting people in South Asia and how continuing changes will affect the region in the future. To broaden our discussion, we're going to bring in three other people who have been following different aspects of this issue. With us from Madurai in southern India is Mridula Ramesh. She's the founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute in India. She's also a clean tech investor who's writing a book about climate change in the country. Joining us from Potsdam, Germany is Jacob Sheva. He's a climate physicist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research who is studying climate change in South Asia. And also with us from Washington, D.C. is Michael Kugelman. He's the deputy director of the Asia program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Welcome to all of you. Rina Chandran, let me start with, uh, I'm sorry, Mridula Ramesh, let me start with you. You're finishing a book about climate change in India. What, what made you want to do this? How has this issue affected you personally? Well, you talked about drought. And um, my journey started um, when we ran out of water at home, like so many millions of Indians do, um, increasingly. So uh, we've been, uh, the region I stay in, Madurai, um, is getting increasingly drier. And uh, uh, we, we get water from the bore well. We don't have a municipal connection. So uh, what people call as day zero in um, Cape Town, Many parts of India are actually living in day zero. Okay, so you're, you you're referencing Cape Town to in South Africa, which uh, has gotten a lot of attention for running out of water. Uh, and the reference to day zero is a reference to the day when there's actually zero water coming through the pipes. Exactly. And uh, the thing is, in India, we've been living in day zero for, I mean, large parts of Indian urban population lives in day zero. We don't have running water. So that's what got me in because we ran out of bore well water as well. 
And, so, and uh, one, one of the issues that you face, I understand, in parts of Tamil Nadu is that the water table has dropped significantly. Uh, talk to us just a little bit about how is that linked to climate change? Well, if um, okay, there are two things, right? There is what you do, and then there is global climate change. Um, many parts of India pay too low a price on water. So what we do is many of us are wasteful users of water. Like Rina was mentioning uh, paddy in the Kaveri Delta. Um, it uses far more water than it needs to. Because a lot of farmers don't, I mean, water is free. Uh, between uh, most Indian cities lose between a third and a fifth of their water to leaks. Um, so, you know, there is the part of certain dry regions in India getting drier because of climate change and because of the change in rainfall patterns. But there's a large role also played by the fact that, you know, we could afford to use our water a lot better. I mean, let me just give you a very quick example. Five years ago, we ran out of water. Last year was the worst drought in over 100 years in my city. Right. So that is definitely climate change. But we didn't buy water. That's because we managed our usage better. And we did rainwater harvesting, you know, uh, uh, making sure more of the water flowed in and was trapped within the ground. Well, let me turn this discussion to Jacob Sheva with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Uh, Mridula was describing the issues of water shortages in southern India. You have done research on the monsoon, which, of course, farmers are heavily dependent on in this region. What, what does the science tell us about what's happened to the monsoon and what's going to happen in the coming decades? Right. So the monsoon is, uh, is a pretty complicated atmospheric system. That's why we actually are not 100 percent certain, certain what's what's going to happen in the future but what we see both in the um, you know in the physical models and what we actually see on the ground is an increase in, in average rainfall which you know sounds good at first sight um, but uh, at the same time we see an increase in, in variability both from one year to the next and within the rainy season so that resonates with what Medulla said that um, you can have an increase in average rainfall going along with um, more intense drought and more frequent heavy rainfall events. And that can be then problematic, for example, for things like groundwater recharge um, when you have um, uh, heavy droughts and then, and then suddenly extreme rainfall that the soil can't take up, then um, that can in the long run reduce groundwater recharge and, uh, and reduce your water resources. Um, despite um, increasing average rainfall. Well, Michael Kugelman, I referenced earlier in the program uh, the issue of uh, heat waves in southern Asia, uh, and that it sounds like you know there's a potential that parts of the region that are very densely populated could basically become like uninhabitable ghost states over the next several decades. Talk, talk to us about some of the most vulnerable areas. Well, I, I would highlight uh, a number of areas. So you could talk about India, you could talk about Pakistan, you could talk about Bangladesh. Um, you know, as uh, Rina uh, had alluded to earlier in the program, um, you know, there are a number of factors that really create a perfect storm for climate change vulnerability uh, in so much of Asia, particularly South Asia. I mean, as she mentioned, you have high levels of poverty, uh, you have, um, you know, rising temperatures, dry climates, um, water shortages, energy shortages, and also this critical issue of very dense uh, coastal area populations. So you have, you know, these cities like Mumbai and Chennai and India and Karachi and Pakistan, which have millions of people located on the coastline, extremely susceptible to rising sea levels and uh, uh, and tsunamis, that type of thing. It could really cause a lot of problems. And, you know, I would highlight in particular Karachi, which is a mega city in Pakistan, it's uh, the largest city in Pakistan, one of the largest cities in the world. Um, you know, imagine if there were to be a, some type of catastrophic weather event coming out of climate change, such as a huge tsunami or something like that. Um, you know, Karachi has a very old nuclear reactor, um, which is located very near the coastline. And if you had some sort of huge um, weather event, you could have a, a tremendous um, harm to that nuclear 
facility, which is in pretty bad shape to start with. Uh, emergency response capacities in Pakistan are relatively lacking compared to many countries elsewhere. Uh, so you could have a total breakdown of, um, of security and order if you were to have some of these climate change effects, like a major storm, um, break out and you could have all types of radio uh, activity, leaks, things like that. I mean, that's a nightmare scenario, but I think that's one example of why these areas um, are so vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. Well, Merdula Ramesh, we heard Michael talking about some of the threats really all across South Asia. Now, I was hoping you'd talk to us just a little bit about public perceptions of the international response to climate change, particularly to that of the United States. President Trump, a number of senior U.S. officials in the current administration are open skeptics of the science of climate change. Uh, President Trump has announced the U.S. Would, would withdraw from the Paris Accords, limiting emissions. Do you see that sort of strain of thought in India? How did Indians react to this? Um, just before I get to your question, I'd like to make a quick point on the heat waves. Um, there is um, one of the reasons we're so vulnerable is we're already quite hot. I mean, uh, the daytime temperatures here are about 40 degrees, between 30 to 40 degrees centigrade. So that's and something like between of, uh, 90 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so they're already there. And, you know, we're having a relatively pleasant summer. So uh, a part of this is also because of what is called an urban heat island effect. So, you know, essentially we're you know, building over a lot of green spaces with concrete. So we're increasing the heat. Um, there was a study that says, you know, a quarter of the world's cities could warm by about seven degrees by the end of the century. And a large part of that is because of the urban heat island effect. So, I mean, that's a couple of points I want to make on the vulnerability. One, we're already hot. Second, we're making it worse by the, you know, not having enough green around and and just having a lot of concrete spaces. Sure, and that makes now, sense that um, when you're talking about heat waves in an already hot place, then you don't have a, a, a degree or two to spare, really. No, I'm, I'm guessing it's quite pleasant there in um, Missouri. Now, coming to the public perceptions, um, at some level, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, Trump and uh, much of the U.S. administration is doing exactly that, uh, what they want to do, because it doesn't matter. I, this sounds pretty harsh, but it doesn't matter what uh, a lot of Indians think. Um, well, so, let me let me uh, ask you to pick up on that point then, <laughs> Jacob Shava. So Mridula Ramesh is saying that um, in some sense it doesn't matter uh, what the U.S. administration does um, w with respect to people. Or people, people in South Asia have no effect on what the U.S. and what other countries do with respect to climate change. But talk to us about that dynamic now. Um, how is that playing out? So if I understood Mirdula correctly, what she's saying is that, that the U.S. government, at least, is pretty ignorant of, of the fate of those people affected by, uh, by climate change. No, I'm saying they fact, don't care. Oh, the, you're saying Indians don't care? No, I, I think she's Trump making the point that, that the, it's not that the, <laughs> the decision makers in the U.S. are ignorant of the science of climate change or the arguments about climate change. Right. It's that they're choosing to do, choosing a different policy course in spite of those arguments. Right. And, my, and I mean, that's not the only government that's, that's often putting, um, you know, short-sighted interests above the, the, the environmental agenda. And there's, there's many, you know, on the surface, there's many, many reasons to do so get reelected, but um, of, of course that doesn't change the physics and the longer you wait to do, with doing something about climate change, uh, the harder the problem comes back to you um, very soon. So um, nonetheless, I mean, I, I think, you know, we're hoping that the U.S. pulling out of the, the Paris Agreement, um, you know, it, it's, it's sad, but um, I think, and it would be interesting to hear from you, but I think there are many people in the U.S. and many actually uh, state governments and city governments that actually do care about the problem and that are implementing both um, adaptation measures and mitigation measures. 
Um, so, so I think the country as a whole is more than the government and, and is moving forward along with uh, much of the rest of the world. So that's, that's quite positive, I would think. And, and so, yeah, let's not get too pessimistic about this, this particular government. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about how climate change is already affecting life in South Asia and how it will change further in the future. We're joined by Merdula Ramesh of the Sundaram Climate Institute, uh, Jacob Sheva of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research, and Michael Kugelman of the Wilson Center. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our video cast on YouTube. Michael Kugelman, if I could turn this to you, you've written extensively about how you see climate change affecting the politics within India, within Pakistan, within Bangladesh. Um, a number of these countries already face uh, issues with radicalism and poverty. How, how is this even on the agenda there? Well, I mean, it depends on the country. Uh, you know, I, certainly, I think that there's a need to build better awareness um, about the threats of climate change uh, in many of the countries of South Asia. But as as we've heard already, clearly the governments are very well aware of of the challenges. Um, and you, know, you look at India, for example, uh, there have been uh, very genuine efforts on the part of the government there to uh, tap into clean ener uh, clean energy sources. And the same with uh, the same with Pakistan. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you look at a country like Pakistan, um, there are so many other issues that are perceived as immediate challenges that uh, far exceed climate change in importance, uh, you know, such as, for example, political survival. I mean, it seems like the political governments in Pakistan are always in some type of crisis and they need to be thinking about surviving, uh, and not getting thrown out of power, more so uh, seemingly abstract issues like uh, like climate change. But, you know, I, we shouldn't understate or we shouldn't minimize what these governments uh, have done. I mean, they are aware of the problem and they are taking uh, certain actions. But you know, I go back to the, to the very first point that you made that, um, you know, you, you really have to worry about the links between these climate-driven resource shortages, uh, particularly in a country like Pakistan, and stability and security. So, for instance, you know, there's a terrorist organization based in Pakistan called Lashkari Taiba, uh, which carried out a horrific uh, uh, series of attacks in the city of Mumbai in India in 2008 killed dozens of people. This is a, a terrorist group that frequently, in its propaganda and messaging, criticizes India for stealing water from Pakistan. And basically, that's because, uh, you know, river water, the Indus River, and its tributaries flow downstream from India into Pakistan. Now, with climate change and its effects, Pakistan has suffered significant water losses uh, in, in recent years through glacial melt and other factors. You know, Lashkari Taiba is essentially able to strengthen its, its, its narrative and its propaganda by saying, well, look, we're losing all this water. It's because India is, is starving us all. Uh, so, you know, if you go down the road a few years or a few decades, when uh, significant areas of Pakistan could become water scarce, not just water short, but water scarce, that could make it even easier for this Lashkari Taiba terror group to essentially say, well, look, it's time to, uh, to retaliate. And you could see some type of uh, campaign of violence uh, in India. So that's, that's what I mean when I talk about the links between natural, resources, re natural resource shortages driven by climate change and um, uh, stability. Well, Merdula Ramesh, we, we just heard Michael Kugelman talking about the issue of water shortages. And I know that your organization, the Sundaram Climate Institute, is trying to do what you call research into the last mile of sort of climate change uh, mitigation or alleviation. Talk to us about what this means in practice. What are some sort of common sense solutions people are trying to put into place? Well, um, we've got two really good resources of water, which we don't use. One is sewage, second is rainwater. So um, one of the simplest things to do is to put a sewage recycling plant, whether in the house or a factory or an apartment block or an office, uh, that saves significant amounts of water. And depending on where you lie on the psychological squeamishness spectrum, you can reuse it for various purposes. The biggest uh, 
thing you can do is actually fix leaks and it's uh, dramatic uh, how much water you can uh, save if you reduce leaks um, because most of us lose so much water because we don't meter our water at all i think one in seven connections in delhi is not metered and many of the others actually ha have meters that don't work and i'm reasonably sure that the situation goes downhill from there so um you know um, those are very simple things you can do well, Jacob Sheva, if I could turn this to you then, um, immigration has become a hot political topic in many developed countries in the United States, of course, especially in Europe as well. And there's an expectation that as global temperatures rise, we'll see more and more people trying to move to other countries as a result. Is there evidence that this is happening already or is this something that's still sort of off in the distant future? All right. So I think, first of all, it's important to make clear that, you know, people move within and across countries for, for many different reasons, you know, be it economic opportunities or, or, you know, just in search for a better life or escaping war and, and poverty. Um, and so the discussion is not whether climate change is going to, you know, trigger large flows of migrants or, or not. Um, we're living in a world that, that's, that's, that's um, seeing migration all the time and it's important to, to recognize that and, and manage that migration well, uh, regardless of the drivers. That being said, uh, we do see increasing evidence that, that migration is one of the adaptation responses that people choose in order to escape um, deteriorating environments when they have no other options left. And so, so we, we, we're becoming more and more um, confident that climate change will change patterns of migration, uh, both within countries, you know, when, you, when you're talking about internal migration and uh, refugees, as well as um, affecting international migration patterns. Uh, and one, one very obvious and, and, and um, yeah, well-documented instance of, of, of that is, is uh, internal displacement due to natural disasters. Uh, there are very um, impressive statistics, let's say, in a, in a negative sense, about the number of people displaced every year by things like storms and, and floods. And those, those numbers are in the millions uh, every year. And we're, we're not really aware of those people because they're being displaced in tropical countries, mainly in, in developing countries. But with climate change exacerbating these, these uh, weather extremes, we're pretty certain to see more of that environment-driven displacement in the future. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Rina Chandran, Merdula Ramesh, Jacob Sheva, and Michael Kugelman. Our producer this week is Blythe Nebaker with supervising assistance from Raina Sims. Jiwan Choi is visual editor. Aaron Hay is audio engineer. Travis McMillan is our director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.